publishers taking on less debuts, white people not getting book sales, romanticy mashups taking up too much shelf space, and TikTok influencers running publishing companies? What is going on with traditional publishing? <laughs> It's Lindsay and welcome back to my channel. Today we are doing the next installment in my series of recent publishing trends. Over the past three months I've been collecting data all about publishing news. I crunch the numbers, run the stats, make charts so that you are informed on the trends happening in children's publishing, know how to best market your books, find good agents to query how to write an engaging query letter, and develop buzzy commercial ideas. And if you're not here for any of those things that's fine. You're probably nosy like me and love publishing tea so here we go. Buckle up. I also so self-indulgently like to end this video talking about some of the recent publishing deals that I personally am most interested in like waiting with bated breath for these books to come out so I can get them in my hands. But before we get into the video, I wanted to take a moment to thank today's sponsor, which is Readsy, who ever so kindly sent me a writing course, and I've been taking it the past three weeks, and I think it's about high time I tell you guys about it. How to Write a Novel aims to help you finish your book in 101 days, with every week getting 10 to 15 high quality lessons sent directly to you, which you can complete completely at your own leisure, all six in one day or over the week, day by day, like I did. The lessons cover literally everything you need to know to write a novel from preparations to beginning, secret sauce characters, writing techniques, soggy middles, dialogue, chapters, literally everything. And one of my favorite parts of the classes are the live weekly feedback circles and webinars that help you connect with other writers and your coach. The entire program feels small and intimate and full of other writers very passionate and serious about taking their writing to the next level. Almost like you're in a tight-knit MFA workshop or college class and I appreciated that so much. Even as someone who's completed multiple books, I found the class was teaching me things that I hadn't really thought of in that way, or I was relearning some things that I hadn't thought about in a while and getting a nice refresh. But I think the thing that I loved most was just how inspiring I found the entire atmosphere. The next class opens on April 8th, and for the April class, they are offering a special deal where you get three one-on-one -on -one sessions with a book coach. These sessions are basically whatever you need them for. If you want some eyes on your outline, if you want to get feedback on your manuscript, or if you just wanna talk about the marketability of your book, they're there for you. If this sounds like something you're interested in, I do have an affiliate link down below that you can click on and check out and learn more about the entire program. And if you join, you can come hang out with me during the live shows and on the forums. We can chat books even more. <laughs> now let's real quick talk about the basics of this video. First of all, all of the deals, all of the information I've collected is available online completely free. You can see it all yourself and do your own numbers if you want. I am signed up for the Publishers Weekly Children's Newsletter and they just send all of the deals every week directly to my inbox. This video will only be covering YA and middle grade literature since there is no adult list. I'm sorry, I wish there was. I wish I could do this with adult trends, but... Alas, I'm only gonna be covering fiction as well. I don't know enough about the nonfiction market to be covering that here. As I always say, there's a good chance my math may be wrong. There's a reason I'm a writer, <laughs> not a physicist. My aim with this video is not to police identities. If someone is open about their identity on social media, then I will include it in my stats. All right, diving right in. So all of these stats were the winter releases. They were collected from December through February, 2023, 2024. Most deals are announced usually four to six months after the book has been purchased. So I am assuming that all of these books I'm gonna talk about today were bought between July and August, 2023. And the total amount of deals announced this quarter was 112, which is down just a little from fall's stats where I had 173. I'm thinking this is because we were getting towards, you know, Christmas and publishing it's a lot slower around that time. I think people are maybe just holding off on announcing or pushed it earlier. And with the time bought, it was during the summer and publishing is kind of known for being a little bit more sleepy during the summer as well. So makes sense. And here you can see the YA and middle grade deal announcement split. This is pretty typical and it's almost identical to the fall quarter. Now we're gonna look at the number of books sold in each deal. Most of them are one book, as you can see a smaller portion, two book and a tiny, tiny bit, three plus books. This also looks very similar to the fall stats that I collected and makes a lot of sense given how publishing likes to operate. I always say at this portion in the video that if you're writing a series, please pitch your books to agents as a 
standalone with series potential. Now let's chat about books sold at auction versus not at auction. An auction is when your agent has sent your book to multiple publishing houses and you've gotten multiple offers from those publishing houses and they kind of get a bidding war over you. Auctions are a little bit more rare so I think that these stats make sense. I also wanted to give you the breakdown of why versus middle grade auctions so you can see that here. And then I also like to keep track of the books that are making a lot of money. So for six figure deals this is what we have. This is the young adult and middle grade breakdown. A lovely subscriber asked if I would do the racial breakdown of the authors who are getting the six figure deals so I have done that here. And then I also jotted down a few of the agencies that are getting these authors the six figure deals. So if you don't have these guys on your list I would definitely add them to it to potentially check out see if they're a good fit for you and your manuscript. And now let's chat book format. So this will be in prose and anthology in verse or graphic novel style. We strangely did not have any fiction anthology sales in either this quarter so that was very interesting. Obviously prose is the biggest chunk not surprising there but I want to pay special attention to the graphic novel portion of the middle grade stat. That is a lot. That is a healthy portion. I mean that is almost a quarter of middle grade sales and if we look back at fall stats when I did this video last time we can see that it's even grown more since then. So graphic novelists this is your time. Now let's talk release season. I wanted to kind of track when books were being announced versus when they were actually scheduled to come out. As we've kind of discussed in previous videos it seems like middle grade is always a season shorter than YA like there's a shorter time period between when you announce and when your book comes out. I don't know for sure but I always think that it's because YA is just bigger, it's more saturated, there's more moving pieces with YA than middle grade so they need a little bit of extra cushioning time. Two really interesting things I wanted to point out. If you pay attention to the summer 25 bars on both graphs you'll see a huge difference between when middle grade books are coming out and when YA books are coming out and I'm thinking that's because publishers like to schedule middle grade books around the time when kids are in school because that's when they're doing the most reading versus in the summer when they want to be out playing and it's kind of the opposite for teenagers right summer is when they have extra time and they'll actually dedicate more time into reading then versus when they're in school and they're already having to do so much work so I just thought that was an interesting stat and if I were to take like a summary of these stats I would say that if you sold a book late summer 2023 it looks like your book is most likely coming out fall 25. So if you're querying right now or you're on submission or you're in talks with a publisher this is something to keep in mind. Taking a look at genre this is really interesting to me. Normally I see fantasy being the biggest chunk but that contemporary being 50% of middle grade sales wow <laughs> wow and if we compare these winter stats to fall stats you can see there's a 10% increase in the contemporary sales in both middle grade and YA. Now there could be a couple reasons for this. I know that a lot of people are mood readers and they like lighter, fluffier, easier to get into books during the summer. Fantasy books you know take a little bit more like brain concentration to like figure out the world and the magic and stuff like that so that could be a reason we're seeing the increase was because these were bought at the height of summer. Kind of contrasting idea is something I talked about in the last video where we were also at the height of the book banning conversations here so maybe publishers were looking for not so much the light and fluffy but the hard-hitting serious topic books to buy and kind of offset the book banning. Interesting too is the horror. We know that YA is kind of having a horror moment right now and if we look between the two seasons we see that the horror section of the pie chart has grown. Strangely we didn't get any middle grade horrors but that's how the cookie crumbles sometimes when you're only doing three month intervals. <laughs> Since YA fantasy spans so many subgenres I always kind of like to break that down a little bit more. So we can see here the split in the fantasies of in the high category and in the low category. High fantasy just means it's a secondary world, a world that you create, and low fantasy means it's pretty much set in our world. There's just some kind of like paranormal or a contemporary fantastical element. And they're usually about evenly split, so this makes sense. Now if you remember from Fall's video, I was really interested to watch the dystopian releases because we had like I think six different deals announced for dystopian or post-apocalyptic books, and I was just like so shocked because for years it was like, don't comp the Hunger Games, don't do dystopian, no, no, no. <laughs> And then we had six releases. When I did the speculative breakdown this time, we only had one book that was labeled as dystopian or post-apocalyptic. So is it gonna have a moment? Is it gonna have a return? Maybe not. I we also have had more and more dark academia fantasies being announced. Now there were three that were actually labeled as dark academia, but I think there are some you can kind of like 
read between the lines and be like, oh yeah, that's said in an academic setting. It probably would count too. But I just put the three on my list that were stated as such. And then eight books were pitched as romanticies. Now again, I think there were some other books that were, you could really tell that that's what it was. They just didn't use the word. But the fact that this word has been used, I think is very interesting and uh, something to hold on to. In Fall's video, I was talking about how Fourth Wing had just come out at the very, very tail end of when I was collecting those stats. And I was really interested to see if there was going to be an increase in romantic purchases given how much that blew up and yes we can definitely see there was and not only is romanticy having a moment we're seeing romance genre mashups happening a lot more often there's a new sci-fi dystopian that's being pitched as a romantic sci-fi and in this quarter alone two books were being pitched as romantic horror which i think is fascinating now let's chat about how many of these books were sold by debut authors versus repeat authors these stats i don't think are out of the ordinary at all publishing doesn't like to take chances too often and so they do seem to buy a lot more books from authors that they know are going to sell well but we do see in YA a bigger portion than in middle grade because YA makes a ton of money if anyone's going to take risks it's going to be YA I thought I would also add in this new little fun section where I talk about the pitches themselves and comp titles and just share some very odd <laughs> trends that I've noticed I know a lot of people struggle with pitching their novels and queries and like coming up with the perfect comp title and uh, it gives a lot of you guys anxiety Anxiety, which it gave me anxiety too when I was in the queer trenches. So hopefully this kind of helps alleviate some of that anxiety. Uh, number one, movie comps. There were a ton of movie comps. These are just a few of them that I grabbed. But don't feel like if you're writing, you know, a YA contemporary horror that you have to comp YA contemporary horrors. You can do other pieces of media as well. Same with comp titles out of your age category. There were a lot of YA pitches that were comping adult movies and books. And I really just enjoyed some of these rather wild mashups. I think that the more we Weird, you can make them. If you can make it weird and make it work, like this one was probably my favorite of all of them. Taking hot button issues like IA and especially in the summer when these types of conversations were really out and about, morphing it with something very well loved and known and putting it in a pitch, brilliant. All right, now let's talk author identities. In multi-gendered author books, we have much more in middle grade than we did in YA. Of course, the children's publishing industry is dominated by women. This is nothing new, but we do see a lot more men writing middle grade than we do YA. And then we have a nice little healthy growth there with non-binary and trans authors. We can actually go back and see last fall's stats and you can see where there's a bit of growth. Next let's talk sexuality. We normally see a larger portion in YA since most teens are starting to explore that area of their life. It makes sense that this is when authors start exploring that more in their literature. Uh, but we still have a little bit in middle grade as well. Talking about race in both middle grade and YA we have around mid 60% of white authors and mid 30% for person of color authors. If we compare these stats to last quarter, you can see where there's actually a little bit of shrinkage there happening on the POC front. I always like to add this stat in in particular because there is this false narrative still running around today that if you were just a white person, you can't sell in YA anymore because all they want is POC books. All they want is diversity, which yes, <laughs> publishing does want diversity, but you're fine. I promise you, Susan. Also, if you were interested for the first time this quarter, I I am doing a POC breakdown so you can actually see the ethnicities of the people in that section of the pie chart. And last, and I was gonna say not least, but kind of least is a disability. <laughs> we had a really great discussion in last quarter's video about the reason why disability representation is lagging so far behind the other marginalities in publishing right now. Go check out that video if you wanna be privy to the conversation and check out the comments because I had some of you guys weigh in with some really, really smart thoughts. But one of my questions for you guys was if we were going to see an increase in disability literature because of the success of Fourth Wing and the fact that the character in that is disabled and the answer is no <laughs> I really didn't think anything was gonna change in fact we have a slight decrease in disability representation in young adults um a little bit of an increase in middle grade but I mean two percent is not enough to write home about that's that on that and now I want to talk about some industry-wide changes we're seeing these are small things that I've just noticed taking place really over the last like six to eight months but I'm gonna start adding in a section of the video talking about this so I thought I'd just cover it all here as we know publishing does everything in really, really slow time. So if we are gonna see change, it's gonna be 
it's gonna be a long time coming so let's talk about social media and what publishing is doing with and about it first of all tiktok we know that tiktok is blowing up book sales finding old books to reach new audiences and blasting some books that are like 10 plus years old back onto the new york times list this is making publishers take note and they want to use it to make money any way that they can and we are seeing that through a couple different ways first is through increased influencer or celebrity books we're seeing a lot more of these recently, including some deals in this quarter. Also through new publishing houses like Bindery, which is like a mashup of social media and publishing where influencers with a high follower count are working as acquisitions editors for a new kind of fan interactive publishing house. It's really, really interesting. One of my friends, Marines from My Name is Marines, is actually one of these such influencers and um, i believe she has a video about it on her channel but she talks a lot more about it on her tiktok so definitely like follow her for all of the latest news on what's happening over there with that because it's definitely something to watch and then this just broke the other day author equity which is kind of like a new type of hybrid publisher it's basically a publishing house that's being run by former big five publishing ceos and apparently they want to be an author focused publishing house that's going to do away with advances and focus on royalty-based salary Calories for authors. I'll link Michelle Schusterman's video essay on it down below where you can hear her thoughts and go into much more depth than I can give here. And then of course we're seeing Kickstarters from authors like Brandon Sanderson, Cassandra Clare, and Sanderson's Kickstarter was the highest grossing Kickstarter in history and it was completely funded by Sanderson's readers and social media followers. So publishers are taking note. Things are changing, slowly changing, but it could lead to something bigger in the future. I'm a big believer in the fact that traditional publishers publishing isn't going anywhere. It's just morphing as ever. It's always been evolving. It's never been stagnant at any point if you look back through history. But it's really interesting to see what all is happening now. And now let's go over some of the deals that I'm most excited for. First, we have The Whispering Legacy by Joe Schult. Alexander Hightower at Little Brown has bought at auction this twisty contemporary YA fantasy. 17-year-old Frankie is tired of her greedy relative's fixation on the family amusement park based on her ancestors' dark and alluring fairy tales and the source of wealth that one of them will inherit. But when Oma, the family's matriarch, goes missing and strange things start happening around the park, it becomes clear there's a more sinister story behind the attraction. First of all, I just love the idea of a dark amusement park. Like, how fun. And inheritance is always something I really enjoy reading about. And then with the missing matriarch, it's giving Knives Out meets like Melissa Albert vibes and I'm here for it. Next, let's talk about A Forgery of Fate. This is by Elizabeth Lim, and she's the author of the Six Crimson Crane series, which I just read Six Crimson Cranes last month, and I was floored with how much fun it was and how much I loved it, and I was so excited to see this announcement that she has another book set in the same world. This is a reimagining of Beauty and the Beast centered on a young art forger who enters a marriage contract with a mysterious dragon lord to pay off her family debts and finds herself entangled in a web of divine assassinations and intrigue. The dragons in this world have like human bodies that they can transform into and I'm just imagining like Game of Thrones level politics and I'm just I'm really excited for it. And then we have The Trees Stare Back by Gigi Griffiths. This is a YA folk horror in which 16 year old Vic's little sister has been missing for five years after venturing into the cursed woods surrounding her Soviet occupied Estonian village. When she returns something is off and Vic begins to suspect the girl with her sister face isn't her sister at all. To get answers, she has to return to the place she's feared the most, the forest, unraveling dark secrets in the process. That sounds so good. 100% here for folk horror vibes all the way. And the returned strange or different trope, I love that. It's so creepy. Plus we have the Eastern European setting and the Soviet Union is like a really cool historical setting situation that I don't think I've read a lot from before. And I mean, that could mean anything, right? Between like the 20s and the 90s. So I don't know what time period it's set in, but I'm excited. And then by Lisa Springer, we have Who's All Going to Die? <laughs> Which is a YA horror pitched as White Lotus meets the island already yes i love me some culty wellness vibes in which a teen girl is invited by a new friend to soft launch an idyllic wellness resort off the coast of barbados only to find her caught up in an overzealous self-help movement <laughs> yes 
yes, spoon feed it to me, inject it right in my veins, I'm ready to go. And last but not least, I thought this sounded so cute. Jill 2's middle grade debut, Kaya Morgan's crowning achievement, follows a 12 year old black girl competing to be queen in her local Renaissance Fair summer camp. Are you kidding me? I'm gonna expose myself for a second. I really loved that show on TLC, Toddlers and Tiaras. <sighs> It's like my guilty pleasure. And of course I wrote the glass witch. So anything with like a little bit of pageantry vibes, 100% here for. And the Renaissance Fair, are you kidding me? I love it. I go every year, I dress up full costume head to toe. So I'm pumped for this one. Also go girl, six figure deal. Heck yeah, get your coin. So thoughts, feelings? Concerns? Have you guys noticed any trends or made any correlations that maybe I missed out on? And are you writing in any of these categories that are seeming to have a moment right now? I do just quickly want to point out, you know, that I, I love making these videos because I love watching trends and following them, but I do just want to make sure everyone here knows that I don't want you to just like write to a trend. In fact, uh, my friend, again, Michelle Schusterman has an amazing video about trends down below that I will link. I wanna make sure that everyone knows that you should be writing books that like make your heart sing. You need to be writing what feels right to you, what feels important for you, what story is just bursting to get out. That is the most important thing because if you're writing with dead bones to a trend that you don't even care about, just hoping you might get picked up, it's gonna come across in your words and in your story. It's just gonna be lifeless and dull and no one's gonna want it even if it has the most buzzy words so i want you to love what you're writing but i want you to be nosy every quarter with me and come watch these videos <laughs> thank you guys so much for watching don't forget that my two spooky middle grade books the glass witch and the odds are both available for order you can find links down below and don't forget to give the readsy class a look too it's a really really good program like honestly I'm enjoying the heck out of it. I hope all of your writing projects are going well. Make sure to keep writing what you love and reading good books and staying hydrated. <laughs> and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.